Well, as always, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to see each of God's people here this morning. I hope that you do count it a privilege and a blessing to be found in the house of God. Uh, this church that our own Redeemer bought with His precious blood. You're a part of that company. You're a part of that people called in eternity by Jesus Christ Himself to come into everlasting fellowship with His Father. It is a precious, precious blessing uh, that belongs to you here this morning. And what I want to do is, uh, again, ask you to take your Bibles, open back to uh, Revelation. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 1. Uh, the purpose of uh, Al and, uh, and Bob reading uh, chapters 4 and 5 uh, as I hope to read, I hope that we will be able to read through the entire book of Revelation in this short series that I'll be doing uh, from Revelation chapter 1 through Revelation chapter 3. That might change, but more than likely that's we're going to end at uh, Revelation chapter 3. But there is such a blessing given in the reading and the hearing of this book that I don't want you to be kept from it. I want you to have the very blessing uh, that God intends when he says, blessed are they that read and those that hear uh, the reading of this book. And so I want you to, to be uh, the beneficiary of that. And what we're going to do today is we're going to continue, as I said, in our series. We're going to take a look at a, a passage of Scripture that sets before us Jesus Christ and all of His exalted glory. It's a wonderful picture that we have of Jesus Christ this morning. We're going to see a number of things by way of the presentation of Christ to us. Number one, we're going to see that there is a self-designation that Christ gives in this passage of Scripture. Again, verses 11 through uh, 20. A self-designation. And he, he refers to himself in the, in the, most, exalted, uh, in the most exalted terms. Uh, he makes reference to the fact that he not only is this one who is exalted over all as the Alpha and Omega here in the King James, and we'll talk about that here shortly, as the Alpha and the, and the Omega, but he also presents himself as the one who was alive and became dead and is now alive forevermore. Our Lord Jesus Christ, and again, it's, it's, it's almost, we almost don't need to say this, but I want you to hear this. Our Lord Jesus Christ never loses sight of the fact that he died for you. He was alive and he was dead and now is alive forevermore. And if Jesus Christ never forgets the fact that he was dead and now is alive, should the church of Jesus Christ forget to proclaim that? Of course not. The, 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 the work of Jesus Christ in dying on our behalf should always be the testimony of the church. But our Lord is going to give this self-designation in this passage of Scripture. The second thing we're going to see in this passage, again, verses 11 through 20 of Revelation chapter 1, the second thing we're going to see is that John gives a description. So there's a self-designation that Christ gives, and then there is a description that the Apostle John gives. And in this description that the Apostle John gives, he's describing what he sees by way of how Christ is being presented in this passage. And the description, again, is an amazing description, as we would rightly expect. It's a description that brings together elements of the Old Testament prophecy of Daniel. When Daniel sees the Ancient of Days on the throne, God Almighty, and the Son of Man coming to the throne, there's a combination of bringing together of that which is used in the Old Testament book of Daniel to refer to, to, the, fall, to, refer to uh, the Ancient of Days, God Almighty, and then to refer to Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. And these are brought together. And what we're seeing here is Christ in his mediatorial glory. And John will give to us a description that sets before us, <clears throat> excuse me, that sets before us Christ in his glory, but also Christ in his function. His function as a priest his function in examining his church, his function in giving a particular dignity to his church. And we'll take a look at that thirdly. The last thing we're going to see here this morning is that in this passage of Scripture, our Lord Jesus Christ is ministering in the midst of his churches, and his ministry to the churches gives to the church a particular dignity. He refers, the, or, I'm sorry, the church is referred to as a goal, as, the churches are referred to as golden candlesticks. Golden candlesticks. And it's said that purposely because there is a particular dignity that belongs to the church of Jesus Christ. The idea of gold represents, again, its worth, its value, its sanctity, we might say. The sanctity which is derived from the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that it is holding a light reminds us of the fact that the church must always shine the light of the gospel in a dark world. And I want you to see and understand from this passage of scripture, we have this exalted, this majestic view of Jesus Christ. But it also reminds us of the dignity that Christ has given to his church. Now, why am I bringing this out in this particular fashion? There is a sense in which, without question, the passage of scripture has its center of gravity in the person of Jesus Christ. There's no two ways about it. 
But yet at the same time, we're going to see how very interesting it is that when John hears this voice behind him, he turns to see this voice. And what he sees immediately, and this is, to me, it was maybe shocking, it's too strong a word. It was surprising to see that John's vision isn't immediately brought to the person of Christ. John's vision is first on these seven candlesticks. And what he sees by way of these seven candlesticks, again, that dignity that is given to the church, to the churches, what he sees in the, in the midst of, the seven, of these seven candlesticks is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we have to preach Christ from this passage of Scripture. He's on these, he's in these verses, he's on the page of Scripture here, and all of his exalted glory. And you remember what I said, I think it was last week or the week before last? So we really need as a church, and I don't mean just this particular church, not the Baptist, I mean the church in general, the church at large, we need to have the view of Christ that is presented in this passage of Scripture. Most oftentimes when we have mental uh, uh, conceptions or pictures of Christ in our mind, we, we think of Christ as he was, that, that lowly man of Galilee, uh, that man who, who loved, and that man who did good, as, 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 uh, as it said in Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 39, I believe it is, he went around doing good. And we oftentimes think of our Lord Jesus Christ from that perspective, nothing wrong with that. But to, but, to, but to fail to think of Christ, as we see him here in this passage of Scripture, really takes away a lot uh, from our experience with Christ as risen and exalted. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is present Christ to you in this, in this exalted way. Part of the reason for that is, is in our day, I think that there is sometimes a challenge concerning how you think about Christ. We live in a day where Christ is presented in all kinds of ways. We live in a day where Christ is enlisted for all kinds of causes that have nothing to do with his cause or the cause of, or, or the cause of his father. And so for us to have this, this biblically centered view of Christ is very, very important. But I also want to say something about the church this morning as well. And again, I'm going to be speaking of the church in two ways. I'm going to be speaking of the church uh, in, its, uh, in its overall sense, uh, what we might call the universal church. Now again, I realize that uh, in one sense I'm, I'm, I'm very... Uh, I, I don't have the wherewithal uh, to speak to the universal church. I realize that the only authority that I have to say anything about the church is the authority of the Word of God. We're going to take a look at some things though about, about the church in its universal setting, but I'm also going to speak about the church in its particular setting, whether it's the particular churches of Asia Minor, the seven that are mentioned, or whether it's this particular church here at Nauset Baptist. And what I want you to see concerning the church specifically in our day is this. And let me read what I have here. Our presentation of Christ in this passage must reflect the glory that we see here. We must have a true view of our Savior, which is always necessary, especially in a day when he is most likely to be misrepresented, even in the house of his friends. We also must speak about the church, because the passage of Scripture brings to us these seven churches. And in this regard, the church, the faithful bride of Christ, in our day, it seems, is more and more maligned and spoken against. We are even considered in many circles as evildoers, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. The church that goes along with society will get along with society. The flag that the town hall flies, the, the, uh, flies, the church will fly. But let a church stand faithful to Christ and watch that church be marginalized. Feel the shame of an evil and adulterous generation heaped upon those who stand in an uncompromising way for Christ. Listen to that church be evil spoken of. Because of this, many will be tempted to be ashamed of Christ and his bride and will melt away into the larger culture. In their mind, they are not leaving Christ. They are just leaving, quote unquote, that church. That will alleviate the pressure for a while, but sooner or later, an individual or a church will either have to, will either have to become totally apostate or cease being a church altogether in order to pacify a sinful generation. I, I, I hesitate to say this next sentence, but I think it needs to be said. In regard to accommodating a wicked generation, you must understand that you can never accommodate a wicked generation sufficiently to satisfy a wicked generation. And I hate to say this, because it's, but even Lot could not satisfy or turn away the, the, the sinful and per, perverse desires of the men of Sodom by shockingly offering his daughters in the place of those angels. Do you understand? 
A sinful and wicked generation will never be satisfied with what you acquiesce unless you acquiesce everything. Therefore, since we face the possibility of seeing the church of Jesus Christ and especially particular churches faithful to him more and more marginalized in our day, I want you to see both the care and the protection that the exalted Christ gives to his church as well as the dignity and the glory by which the church is described. Every true church of Christ is a golden candlestick in its generation. These words, this passage, our glorious Christ in this passage of Scripture presented to us, and the call to this church as the call to every church throughout the ages is still the same. We must be a golden candlestick in the day and age in which we live. It's a challenge, yes. The people of John's day, the, the, the people of, uh, of John's day, when the book of Revelation was written, they were under, they were under much, 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 uh, much stress by way of these things. And yet there they were, <clears throat> again, standing faithful for the cause of Christ. Well, again, by God's grace, I hope to open up this passage of Scripture to you along the following uh, points, as I've already uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, Christ's self-designation, uh, John's descriptions, and then the church's dignity. Uh, the church's dignity. I'm going to be reading this morning from uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter one, verses eleven through twenty. I will be reading from the King James. There's probably a King James Bible in the pew if you want to follow along with me. And the reason why I'm bringing this out is because we do have a something of a textual issue that we have to address as we go forward. <clears throat> so Revelation chapter one. And actually, I'll start with verse ten. Revelation chapter one, verses ten through twenty. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, Tyra, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, <clears throat> clothed, with a, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Well, let's take a look then at this passage of Scripture. And the first thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture, as I said before, are the, is the self-designation that we have by our Lord Jesus Christ concerning his identity. As we come to the passage of Scripture, what's kind of interesting to see is that before Christ gives this designation, these terms that describe who he, or, or uh, they set before us who he is, what we see is something of a preparation on the part of the Apostle John. Now, we might not, uh, we might not catch that at first reading, but I want you to notice once again, uh, chapter, uh, verse, uh, one, I'm sorry, chapter 1 of, uh, and, and verse 10, where we see the passage of Scripture. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a, as of, as of a trumpet. Now, you remember last week we spoke about something about being in the Spirit. We said how that this was for the Apostle John, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, time, a wonderful state where, where his soul was kind of elevated in such a way as to be able to rightly receive the revelation that was about to be given to him by our Lord Jesus Christ. We said a number of, th of things about this idea of being in the Spirit. We said, number one, that the person uh, who is a, a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Christian, by, by, by way of grace, is in the Spirit. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, uh, verses uh, 7 through 9, I believe it is, uh, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And so there's a sense in which every believer is in the spirit. 
There's also another sense when a believer is in the Spirit, when, when he or she has those things uh, by way of the operation of the Spirit of God upon the soul, where the things of life are rightly, are rightly prioritized. The things of this world are more to the periphery, uh, or to, 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 to the outward circle than they are to the center of our lives. And spiritual things take central place. And there is a sense in which the Spirit of God operates upon the soul of the believer. There are wonderful times, are they not? When the Spirit of God is, is present in a very manifest way. When maybe there we are in our, in our times of prayer with God, reading the Word of God, and the Spirit of God seems to be opening the Scripture to us in a way that, that maybe is just wonderful to the soul. It makes those times with God very, very precious. There are times when the people of God gather publicly and the Spirit of God manifests Himself in a very wonderful way by way of, the, by way of exhibiting Christian love and kindness one for another. A sense, of, a sense that when all was said and done, God visited with us that day. It's a beautiful thing to have. But I believe that when John says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, I believe that there was even a greater act of grace being exhibited upon his soul. John was being rightly prepared for the revelation that was being given to him. And the other thing that we see here uh, by way of this, uh, by way of this uh, preparation, we might say, is in that blast of the trumpet. Notice again verse 10 here. And heard behind me a, a great voice as of a trumpet. Here there's a sense in which John was being called to attention. The idea of the trumpet has this idea of clarity, this idea of clearness, this idea of coming and catching the attention. And I think that there's something that we can say by way of application it's not, it's not a point of application that we can overwork, but I think it's a point of application that we should give some attention to, and it's this. There, there's, there, there needs to be preparation of the soul when we, when we begin to, to deal with the things of God. There needs to be a preparation of the soul when we come into the place of worship. There needs to be, again, in our mind, again, an awareness that I'm, I'm, I'm coming into the, into the house of God to hear the word of God being set forth, to engage in the worship of God by way of, by way of singing of, of hymns to his name. Did you ever did you ever sing did you ever sing a, a lullaby or a song or, or a hymn to a loved one? Did you ever in, in, in a moment maybe of your loved one being in a in a very distressing situation? I, I one of my one of the most blessed experiences of my life, my mother was on her deathbed, and there I was singing, singing hymns to her. It was wonderful. And again, I'm not saying in a in a, in a it was just very softly, very quietly. Just, just singing a hymn to, to, my, to my mother when, when, our brother, uh, when our brother Charlie went home to be with the Lord. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. There we were. I think it was maybe the morning, either the morning of, the, of his passing or his home going or, or, the, or, or the day before we were singing uh, his, uh, what was his favorite hymn again? Uh, we sang it last week at the end of the service. Um, it is well with my soul. And there we were, uh, his some of his kids were there, and Wendy was there, and we were singing it as well with my soul. And I mean it, Charlie lit up when he heard that hymn being sung. When you come to the place of worship, you hymn your glorious Savior. You sing songs to your Savior. That's why we come to worship. The word is preached. Hymns are sung to the Savior. Prayer is offered up. And so again, there should be preparation for that. Now John was in the Spirit. Would the God, would the God that every one of us would be in the Spirit on the Lord's day? John heard this voice as it sounded like a trumpet. May we hear in the call to worship the voice of Christ calling to his people to prepare the heart for what is about to happen. And so there was John on the Lord's day prepared for this revelation now again, we have here in verse 11, I know if, you're, if you have a, a newer translation, if you have the King James or the New King James, it will read as follows, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. If, if you have one of the newer translations, it will just say, uh, what thou seest, right in the book. And what we're dealing here with is, again, something of a technical issue. I have to at least address it in some way. I'm not going to address it sufficiently here, but I just want you to be aware of it. Basically, what we're dealing with at this point are two different families of Greek text that are used in our various translations. Uh, some of our translations, the King James, the New King James, uses uh, what we would call a, uh, what's called the majority text. Uh, there's a sense in which there's a multiplicity of witnesses by way of the manuscripts. 
Some of those manuscripts are not as old uh, as the uh, manuscripts that are used for our newer translations, and that's why many times you'll see in the margin of your ESV or your, NI, or your NIV or your NASB that the, uh, the, the, best and earliest uh, the best and earliest manuscripts say such and such. Well, there's a, there's a whole discussion that takes place as to, as to what, uh, what family of manuscripts should be used. Uh, obviously, I'm in favor of, the, uh, of what's known as the majority, uh, the majority text. And much of the time when we get to translation issues, it's not so much translation as such. Uh, the translation can be maybe uh, not as archaic as it is in the King James and be brought up to date somewhat. Uh, but it's really an issue of the, the family of text that the, uh, uh, that the, main, that, that the uh, translations are, are based on. And so the, the majority text, the, the text that, 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 I, uh, that I do prefer, does include this reference to Christ as the Alpha and Omega. Now let me say this. This is a very significant statement that our Lord is making concerning himself. This statement is huge. And in one sense... It begins to prepare us for a, a presentation of Christ in not only his mediatorial glory, but in his essential glory as well. So what we have is our Lord Jesus Christ uh, presenting himself not only as the one who is performing a work of salvation or a work of mediation on, the, on, on behalf of sinners, he is presenting himself as to who he is in his essential nature. He is Alpha and Omega. Now, this, this designation is very significant, especially in the book of Revelation. It's used four times in the book. Well, if you're reading the King James, it's used four times in the book of Revelation. Twice it's used of God the Father. Twice it's used of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're using the newer translations, it's used of God the Father twice, and then it's used of once of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 13 through 16. But the point I want you to see is this. This is a designation of our Lord Jesus Christ whereby he sets forth for the church who he is in all of his essential glory. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And that's something you and I need. To, that's, something that, that, that's something that these churches that were, that were fluctuating in faithfulness, that were coming under the threat of persecution, that's something that they needed to hear in their day. And we need to hear it in our day as well. The one who you worship this morning is the Alpha and the Omega. And we see this again set forth not only in verse 11 here, but in, in, uh, in Revelation uh, 22, uh, verses uh, 13 and 16. Now this, this designation as the, El, El, as the Alpha and Omega, uh, the beginning and the end, there's so much to be said about it. This, 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 uh, this title is so rich. Uh, I was saying to Elizabeth this morning uh, that, uh, that there's just so much content uh, in, in this opening uh, chapter of, of Revelation. I hesitate to go at the pace we're going. Which, which might seem slow to you, but, but seems to be a little too fast for me. And the reason why is because uh, there's just so much there. This title, Alpha and Omega, could be developed in a sermon in and of itself. It has everything by way of, uh, of, of God being before all things and then nothing being after God. He's the, he's the first and he's the last. Jesus Christ, the first and the last. It has this idea of the eternality, of the nature of God himself. Nothing before God and nothing after God. It's a wonderful description of God in his essential glory. A wonderful description of Christ in his essential glory. It's very interesting that... When this, uh, when this phrase Alpha and Omega was, was, uh, was used uh, in, the, in the very early church, it was always used specifically in reference to Christ. Uh, one uh, resource says this, whatever may be the origin of, the, of this phrase, and again, it gets into the history of it, much by way of what is said in Isaiah, uh, God re uh, revealing himself as the first and the last. Now Jesus taking that designation to himself you see, Jesus is purposely identifying himself with everything that is true of the essence of God. And this, uh, this, uh, this resource goes on to say this, uh, whatever else may be the origin of the phrase, its chief significance for Christians lies in its constant application to Christ, of which this passage in, the Re in Revelation supplies the first of countless instances. Uh, and again, just going on to say how significant it was. Not only was this the universal opinion of the earliest commentators as of the Christian as uh, as the author of the book of uh, Re Revelation, it was an opinion deeply rooted in the conviction of of the uh, of early Christian congregations. We hear of no attempt to dispute it and rely on this as an established fact. Again, the church kept referring to Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega. And again, please hear me out what I'm saying here. I want you to understand that this title of Christ as the Alpha and Omega is not only here in verse 11 of chapter 1 from the King James, 
But even if you're using the new, uh, I'm sorry, the, that family of text that, that by way of its own you know, designation goes back further uh, to the uh, to probably the second or third century, if, even if you're using that family of text, Revelation chapter 22, verses 13 through 16, we still have this title in the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. He refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega. So I want you to see how Christ presents himself in this passage in Scripture. He is the Almighty and the Eternal. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. And what we see here is that this, is this, is this designation uh, refers to him as the sovereign, oh, as the sovereign God over all their personal circumstances. This is very important. This is again what this, uh, what this authority states. It says the following, this, this, uh, this title represents Christ as the sovereign over all their personal circumstances. He is Lord of creation and Lord of the new creation. He is victorious over every contender and no rival, can, no, no rival power can keep him from accomplishing his purpose and plan. Knowing that God is in control of history encourages the, encourage the early Christians who were being threatened by worldly powers while economic, religious, and military powers such as Rome may seem invincible from a human perspective, they are in reality under the ultimate control of the triune God who holds time and eternity in his hands. This designation of Christ as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, is fundamental to all of our being able to engage whatever is in front of us as a church. As I said, that you know, again, I don't want to, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be like Chicken Little, the, 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 the sky is going to fall tomorrow. I don't want to be that way. But I don't want us to be ignorant of the day that we live in. I don't want us to be ignorant of the, of the cultural trends that we see. It's more and more understandable in our day than maybe in any time in our lives that we can see political powers exerting, uh, exerting pressure on the church either to, either to not say things or to say things or not to do things or not to open. You know how this goes. And so I want you to see that our Lord Jesus Christ, as he revealed himself to these seven churches, he reveals himself to us in the same way. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so again, we see this. So this, this self-designation of our Lord Jesus Christ is, is wonderful to see. Another place where we see the self-designation of Christ is, is, is found in verses, uh, in verses 17 and 18. So take a look at verses 17 and 18 here. We see this, and, and when I saw him, this is, re this is a reference, of course, to John. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Again, there is that statement where Christ is claiming to himself everything that, that, that is inherent to the essence of, of, of deity. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. I want you to see a couple of things here. Number one. The self-designation of Christ continues. Christ is, is, again, giving to us this, this designation of who he is. Who is he? He is the first and the last. Who is he? He is the one who was alive and became dead and is alive now forevermore. Who is he? He is the one who has the keys of hell and death. Do you understand who Jesus Christ is? He wants you to see this. He wants this to be structurally in your mind when you think of the things that you undergo in this world. He wants you to be aware of these things when threatening powers seem to impose itself upon the church of Jesus Christ. He wants you to know who he is. And I think it's a very wonderful thing to see by way of what he's doing to John here. Here he is, John, falling down as one who is dead. There's a, there's a sense in which John, this, this very spiritual man by way of the regenerating grace of God, this spiritual man by way of uh, the ongoing work of the Spirit of God, this spiritual man by way of the special act of grace upon his soul, this vision of Christ was too much for him in a sense. He fell at his feet as dead. And aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ reaches down? You remember what we said last week about this, uh, about the... Um, uh, about uh, the, uh, the fact that in spite of, in spite of the persecution uh, and tribulation that John was suffering, there was no barrier to spiritual blessings. Remember we said that? Remember how we said that one of the spiritual blessings that John was a participant of was the fact that Jesus Christ reached down and put his hand on him and lifted up and spoke to him. Persecution is no barrier to hearing the voice of God in the scripture, you see. And so there was the Apostle John being ministered by, to by our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very, very, very precious to see. And so again, we have this self-designation of Christ. So much could be said here. As I said before, the passage of Scripture is just so heavily weighted with, uh, with, 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 with the central uh, truth. Uh, to go on to speak of what it is uh, for Christ to be the first and the last, to exhaust that, we would have to go back to the book of Isaiah, where God is saying these same things about himself. 
God, the, uh, Yahweh, is saying that he is the first and the last. And we see our Lord Jesus Christ ha ha taking this title to himself. Not merely having it ascribed to him, but taking this title to himself. Oh, to speak of our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who was living, and literally the passage says, and became dead. He entered into death. Why did he enter into death? In order that he might destroy death. In order that he might destroy the effects of sin. In order that he might pay the price for my sin and for your sin. And is alive forevermore. Death has no more power over our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this concept is, is, uh, is taken up by the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 in a very, very important uh, uh, passage of Scripture that has to deal with our, with our sanctification. And when the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6 there that Christ dieth no more, he's putting it in comparison or in, in the context of a passage of Scripture that speaks how that sin no longer has dominion over the believer's lives. Now, you and I might be tempted by sin. You and I might fall prey to sin. You and I might foolishly choose to enter into sin. But sin is a dominating power. That power has been destroyed. Sin has no more power over you and your conduct than death has over Christ. That's a liberating thought. That's a wonderful way to, to engage the world in which we live, to think, oh, how many, because, you know, you know, we, we have a track record in these things, don't we? We think, oh, this time I'm going I'm to fall again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do... No! Christian, preach to yourself. Understand who Christ is. He was the one who was living and became dead and was alive forevermore. Death has no more dominion over him. And so again, this, this designation of Christ, we can go on and on. The keys of, of hell and death. You see, Christ is the one who, who by way of his authority, who by way of his, by, 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 by way of his majesty... He's the one who, who holds the keys to these things. Why should the Christian fear death? There is no entering into death apart from the key of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful unto death as we see in this passage of Scripture. And as, we see, as we'll see in the book of Revelation. So again, this, this self-designation of Christ, it's beautiful. The next thing we have is the, is, is, the, uh, is the description of Christ given by the Apostle John. And we see this primarily in verses 13 uh, through 16. Look what we have here. In verses 13 through 16, we have the following. And, um, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the floor, and girt about the paps with a golden girder, uh, gir uh, girdle. Uh, his, head was, his head and hairs were like wool, and white, and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as, as, as if they were burned in a furnace, and the voice of, as of the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in its strength. Now, we are entering in here to, uh, although we've encountered it before, but we're entering into what's known as the symbolism of the book of Revelation. And one of the things that makes the book of Revelation a challenge, and one of the reasons why I think people like hearing individuals preach from the book of Revelation is because they think that there is going to be some type of insightful interpretation or meaning given to a symbol. And sadly, there's much by way of fancy and by way of exaggeration that often attends to explaining what the symbols were. Whenever we come to the symbols in the book of Revelation or anywhere in Scripture, we have to proceed with, with much caution and, and much you know, care. But there are times when there are elements of, 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 uh, of the symbol that are very easy to see. Let me say this about a symbol, and this is important. A symbol is that which signifies something else. Normally, for a symbol to be valid, there has to be something that corresponds between the symbol and the reality that it's expressing. So when our Lord Jesus Christ is presented here as having eyes of fire, speaking of his piercing gaze, there's a sense in which even in that expression, there's an element in which Christ is, is never ceasing to be a judge. Now again, we're not going to be judged for our sins. We've passed from judgment unto life. But Christ, in his, in, his, in his engaging of the church, is examining the church. There's a sense in which his piercing gaze can be represented by flames of fire. 
That idea where he has this, this, uh, this hair uh, white as snow, it's not speaking of decrepit, him being old and decrepit. It's speaking, again, of his, uh, something of his dignity, of, his, of, his, uh, of, the, uh, of the majesty of his, uh, of his being. Everything that we would attribute to what we would call uh, honorable uh, maturity of an individual is ascribed in a sense to Christ. So all these things have to do with how do we explain and how do we interpret these symbols. We have to be very, very careful. But I do think that there are some things that we can gather uh, from, the, this, uh, from this designation that we see. And the first thing that I want you to be aware of, and this becomes very significant, if you don't mind, take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And I want you to see that Daniel is, I'm sorry, that John is purposely weaving in passages and allusions and inferences from the Old Testament into the very way that he conveys how he sees Christ. And we might say it like this, that John is so full of biblical content in his mind and in his soul that when he sees this presentation of Christ, he cannot think in any other categories other than biblical categories. And when he sees Christ, he expresses him here. Notice what we see here in, um, in Reve- and I'm sorry, in Daniel uh, chapter seven, verses nine and thirteen. Uh, Daniel chapter seven, verse nine. And I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days, whose garment was white like snow, whose hair was whose hair of his head was as pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels were burning fire. Down to verse thirteen. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was, uh, verse 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. What I want you to see here is that when John sees the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a bringing together of both that which is referencing the Ancient of Days and that which is referencing the Son of Man. He brings these together in this description, and I do think it is, it, it is very, very important for us to see that. The other thing I want you to see is this, is that in this description of our Lord Jesus Christ that John gives, we see that, that our Lord is, 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 is described for us in probably in two functions. Now, there's, the, there's, there's, some, uh, there's dialogue that goes on at this point uh, among the commentators, uh, one element of the dialogue is, is Christ here represented as a priest? And I think there's much to be said for that. The, the, the robe and the, and, 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 and the golden girdle, which is not merely around the waist, but covers his entire torso, that has a reference uh, to something, it has a reference to the ministry of the priest. And so I think there's much that we can see here by way of, the Christ, of, of Christ's priestly work. But other commentators, and just as convincingly, They speak about this description of our Lord Jesus Christ, which presents him in his capacity as a judge. All judgment is given over to the Son. All judgment, again, is is under his authority. We see this in a number of places. Uh, Paul, when preaching in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, he is appointed a day whereby he will judge uh, the men by that... uh, 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 judge uh, all mankind by the one whom he has appointed. And so there's, there seems to be a sense when, where, where there's uh, maybe uh, Christ is a priest or Christ, Christ is a judge, or maybe we bring them together. And maybe we see in this our Christ, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ acting as both priest and judge in this case. We see other descriptions here. As I said before, uh, his head and his hairs uh, being white as snow show the fullness of divine wisdom. Matthew Henry gives the summary, uh, a, a, a summarization of this description in the following way. He says, that he says he was clothed with a garment down to the foot, a princely and priestly robe denoting righteousness and honor. He was girt about with a golden girdle, the breastplate of the high priest, on which the names of his people are engraven, and he was ready to do the work of a redeemer. His head and his hairs were white like wool or snow. He was the ancient of days. His white, hoary head had no sign of decay, but was indeed a crown of glory. His eyes were a flame of fire, piercing and penetrating into the very hearts and the reins of men, scattering terrors among his his, his adversaries. His feet were like in the burning grass, strong, steadfast, supporting his own interests and subduing his enemies, treading them to powder. His voice was the sound of many waters, many rivers falling together. He can and will make himself to be heard to those who are far off as well as those who are near. His gospel is a profluent and mighty stream, 
fed by the upper springs of infinite wisdom and knowledge. He had in his right hand the seven stars. That is, and again, we're going to have to get into an interpretive matter here. He had in his right hand the seven stars. That is, the ministers of the seven churches who are under his direction. They have their light and their influence from him and are secured and preserved by, by him. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which both wounds, heals, and strikes its sin on the right hand and on the left. His countenance was as the sun shining in its strength, too bright and dazzling for mortal eyes to behold. John falls down at his death. You can understand why. And so here we have this self-designation of Christ. Here we have this description of Christ given by the Apostle John. So much we can say. We've not even gone into the we've not even gone into the to the question of what is meant by the seven churches. How are we to understand them? Let me just touch on that very briefly. These seven churches were literal historical churches that this book of Revelation was specifically written to to minister to them in their day. I do think, however, that by the by the designation of uh, the number seven, there is something by way of the perfection that we see that the number seven uh, represents. And it is my conviction that what these seven churches represent are things that every church in every age will have to deal with. There is such a, a description, such a broad and wide description of the failings, of the sins, of the things that are commendable in the churches that are given in the seven churches that we'll take a look at. That in a very real sense, these, the, these seven letters to these seven churches are truly letters to every church in every age. That's why, again, our Lord Jesus Christ says at the, every, at the end of every one of these letters, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, it's kind of interesting by way of historical note of uh, the seven churches, the way they were laid out geographically. They were something of a, of a traveling route where somebody could have very easily started at Ephesus and worked all the way around to Laodicea. And what, that, what, and what the messenger would have done is the messenger would have given not only the specific letter but the entire book of Revelation to each one of the churches. But I do believe, again, that we have to see the, 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 the actual historical literal reference to the to seven churches, but we also need to understand what Christ is saying to those churches. He's saying to every church and to every age. The question as to the the um, the question as to the uh, uh, the star. Well, actually, you know what? I, I'm 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 getting away from my uh, from my outline. So let's, So we've seen the we've seen the self designation. We've seen the description of Christ. Now I present to you the church's dignity, and I can't make an, I can't mention this enough this morning. Obviously, the center of gravity in this in, in this passage of scripture is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and all of His exalted glory. There's no two ways about it. But there is in this passage of scripture. That which presents to us the dignity of the church of Jesus Christ. It's dignity not only universally as the bride of Christ, but also it's dignity in the particular manifestation of the church in every local situation. What do we see concerning the church of our Lord Jesus Christ? Notice what, what we see here in verse 19. We, write, we read the following. Write the things which thou hast seen. The things, which, uh, the things which are, and the things which, which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. The first thing I want you to see here is this. In this passage of scripture, you heard me say this last week, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has given to the Apostle John a, a, a divine outline for the book of Revelation. The things which you are seeing are the things that he is recording here in, um, in, uh, in, in, in chapter 1. Now, different commentators outline the book of Revelation differently. I would suggest this, that the things which thou seest are the th is the revelation that Christ was giving to John there on the Isle of Patmos, that what, we, what we've seen in this first chapter. But I would also suggest to you this, that the things which are would be the things that are contemporary to the, to the existence of those seven churches. So the things that you see, the things which are the seven churches, and the things which are to come, the chapters four, uh, chapters four through twenty-two. There are other ways to the, to, to 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 see that outline, but I would suggest to you uh, that's at least one of the ways, and I would see it from that perspective. Chapter one, the things that are. Chapter, I'm sorry, the things that thou see. Chapters two through three, uh, the things which are. Chapters four through twenty-two, the things which uh, shall yet are, are yet to come. But what I want you to notice here is the dignity that is ascribed to the church. Notice this again. Here our Lord Jesus Christ, you might remember what I said last week, John received not only a divine outline of history, he also had the explanation of a mystery. 
the outline of history and the explanation of a mystery. Verse 20, chapter 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now get back to the idea of symbolism. Remember, as we said before, that this, uh, a symbol is that which represents something else, something, we might even put it this way, something deeper, something more significant. But there's, usually, there's, there's, there's almost always a correspondence between the symbol and, the, and, 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 and what is actual. And the point I want you to see here is that the church is referred to, the churches are referred to as golden candlesticks. By way of interpreting symbols, one of the things that you have to kind of engage in is what would that symbol have meant to the original readers? Well, gold, again, even in our day, but gold, especially in that day, had everything by way of worth and value. In some, in some cases, uh, gold was reserved for religious purposes. And so what you're seeing here, as I said before, you're seeing this dignity that is, that is, that is given to the church, not naturally by virtue of who and what we are, but what we are in relation and in union to Jesus Christ. Did you ever, let me ask you this to, 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 to kind of advance this idea. They're, they're candlesticks. They're not lamps. A candlestick doesn't burn in and of itself. A candlestick can only hold that which burns. And what the church holds is the light of the gospel to this world. And so the point I want you to see here is essentially this. The church of Jesus Christ in every age, and especially in our day, in our age, has a responsibility by way of its dignity to reflect that dignity in the way that we live our lives, not snobbish looking down, not walking around like, like, uh, like, uh, like God called in the, uh, you know, called uh, in, 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 an issue with the people of Isaiah's day, uh, I'm holier than thou. That's not us. We humbly walk before men and women. We present to them the, the grace of God. We show to them that there is a, a gracious Savior. I love this thought concerning the gospel. There's a sense in which when we preach the gospel, we have to say God commands, God commands all men everywhere to repent. But there's another sense in which you can preach the gospel and say this. Do you know that Christ is calling you into his kingdom? Do you know that Christ is calling you into heaven? And you, you can set before individuals, again, this idea that God is gently calling. There are times when God roars, as it were. There are other times when God is speaking, calling gently. And so the church, as a golden candlestick, must hold forth the light of the gospel. We must conduct ourselves in a way that, that brings you know, honor, and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, honor uh, to, to the name of Christ. We must not live in, in dishonorable ways. And may God give us grace. And so again, we see the church in their dignity. Now, the, the, the church is in their dignity. The other thing I want you to see here, again, we have that, we have that explanation here. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches. This has led to, this is another one of these places where a lot of, you know, discussion takes place. And there are some who believe that, uh, that, the, that, that this is a reference to churches actually having an angel. So that each specific church has an angel. Uh, there are many who make that case. Most, however, seem, particularly in our day, uh, most, however, seem to, to lean to the fact that this is not so much a reference to angelic beings uh, that a church is accountable uh, for before God, but rather this is a reference, the word angel, literally in its normal sense means messenger. And the idea here is this, is that John was, was giving the, this, this book of Revelation to the seven messengers that had come from these seven churches. Many also believe that the, the, the reference here isn't just to a messenger in the sense that, uh, who was it? And I should know this off the top of my head. Who was it? The Phoebe, which, was, uh, which brought the letter, uh, the epistle of, 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 of the Romans uh, uh, to Rome. Uh, she was a messenger in that sense. Uh, many feel that it's not just uh, limited to that. Many feel that this is a reference uh, to, to the elder in the church that there is a sense in which when Christ is speaking uh, to a church, he's addressing the leadership, and he's calling them to account for what is in the church. Now, I think the, the way I see this, I don't think that the, the idea of an angel to, to a specific church, I think I wouldn't go there. I think it's more this idea of a messenger and also the idea of responsibility uh, that we see there in the church. And so what we're seeing here is this. These stars, again, the, I'm sorry, the, these, uh, uh, these, the, the, these, uh, the, the angels here, these stars are the angels, which are the messengers. And you might think that that's too, much, that's too high of a designation uh, for a human individual. 
But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says this. He says, you shine as stars among, uh, among the night. Uh, among the night. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. And so this designation for a believer as that which gives forth light is completely consistent. Why am I bringing all this out? Why am I emphasizing this? And let me say this just in passing. You see how much detail is in this book of Revelation and how it could take a very, very long time to get through it. We are, I am trying to incorporate some of the larger things and move forward kind of as quickly as we can without losing much by way of content. But what I want you to see and, and, and what I want you to understand is this. There is a dignity that is given to the church by way of how Christ sees it. The world might see the church as fill in the blank. But that's not how Christ sees it. Christ sees individual churches as golden candlesticks in a dark and corrupt age. The world might see the church, again, fill in the blank, but Christ sees his church as a glorious bride. And I am saying these things because I'm convinced in our day the more you or I or the more that this church stands for Christ. And it's interesting. You don't have to pick a fight in our day. You just have to stand on the word of God. Amen. And the culture is going so quickly and so swiftly away from the standard of the word of God, you don't have to go anywhere. And when people turn around and say, well, why are you doing What's, what, I, this, this, is, this is what the word of God said. This is what it's always said. And the word is going to, I'm sorry, and the church, the, the world will, will malign the church. It'll make you feel shame for attending a church. It'll question why you're identified with that church. But I want you to see that in the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are a light placed upon a golden candlestick. And when our Lord Jesus Christ says, Repent unless I take the candlestick away. We do not want that to happen to this individual congregation. My brothers and sisters, you have the light of the gospel. Let us first of all live by it. Let us, let us love it and Christ enough to make it known to those that we come in contact with. You don't have to be a wrecking ball. You don't have to be, again, a disaster to be around. You can very winsomely, very kindly, very engagingly tell your friends, your neighbors, your family, did you know that God invites you to his kingdom? Did you know that God calls you to heaven? Would you come? Would you go? I can show you how to get there. He's made a way. Our Father and our God, give us grace, we pray, to see Christ in all of his exalted glory. And help us to shine, we pray, Father, in this dark age in which we live. Give us grace, we pray, Lord God, to not fear man's wrath, nor, nor respect unduly his favor, but help us, we pray, Father, to stand firm for our Lord Jesus Christ, that the light that you've placed within this little congregation may never be extinguished. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.